Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss emerging trends in data architecture. What's the next big thing? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists. We may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you the speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience in helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Donna, hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Happy 2024. Good to kick off another year of these events. <clears throat> We've been doing this for quite a while. I um, mean, these are always popular, especially this sort of emerging trends one uh, that we always kick off the year with. Um, but if this is your first time joining us, um, hopefully this is a good thing for you that we we have a whole year of lineup and we have this as a monthly webinar on data architecture strategy. So you'll see a wide range of topics across uh, data architecture, some of which we will hi highlight today as trends, a little spoiler alert. Um, and the other nice thing about data diversity is that all of these are recorded. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're able to, to not catch one and you have to catch it later, always better live because there's always a vibrant Q&A. Uh, but these are all available and as, as well as past years as well. So welcome if you are new to this, this session. So what we're going to be talking about today, as, as Shannon mentioned, is um, what is the next big thing? So much evolves in the industry, as Shannon said, it's actually almost 30 years now I've been doing this. Um, and so much has changed in the industry, but in some ways, sometimes it's the same foundational things we've been working on, right? So how with, you know, and I, full disclosure, I think it was in my bio, I, I have been a software vendor and I get the space and I understand it and I love it. Um, but often the vendors are always sort of trying to create the new next big thing to, you know, <laughs> kind of create some hype. So it can be very exciting, but also very challenging to be in this industry to really how to cut through what is hype and what is actually real practical value and what's different and what's the same thing repackaged, right? So what we will try to do today is, is kind of talk through that and hopefully give some guidance um, as you folks do this in your day job. So just some clarity in the beginning. Um, the, you'll see some data, data about data here. Um, so uh, based on a research paper that Data Diversity and, and my firm Global Data Strategy have been doing for, oh gosh, I think five years now, um, on trends in data management. So you'll see some actual data-driven um, figures from there. The other good news is this is available free for download either on the Data Diversity uh, site or our own site, which is Global Data Strategy under the Resources White Paper section. So we'll give you a sneak preview into this, but there's a whole lot more uh, meaty research in there. A um, the question that's always asked because we are data folks is, you know, what is the survey size? What is the sample size? Um, it is over, you know, almost 300 people, 285 folks from 35 countries and over 25 industries. And we will go into that a little bit more. Um, but it's a really nice cross section. And we've been doing this for a while and, and are able to truly see some trends that we will talk about as we go. So hopefully you'll enjoy that as well. So why are we talking about this? Because unless you've been living under a rock, um, you heard this term data driven business or data driven organization. And it is true, more and more organizations are you know, competing on data as a competitive driver. Um, and, and you'll see both of these um, have, have data as the main topic, but their business periodicals, right? Forbes, Wall Street Journal, this isn't, you know, data diversity, which you expect to talk about data. These are business journals talking about data. And I think a lot of you are probably, you know, have, have, we have the job we do or, or on this call because your management is asking that question, how do I become more data-driven or be a data-driven organization? And what does that mean? Uh, but more importantly, how do we support that from the data architecture perspective? And again, what's hype, what's not? Because I'm sure we've always had, all, 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 all have had um, that topic of, you know, CEO reads, 
something in the paper and says, you know, can we do AI or, or should we be doing a data lake or, you know, what's the data mesh and should I be thinking of it, right? So as you go through, you know, hopefully some of these trends can give you some meat behind well, what are people really doing and getting benefit from and what might be a little bit of hype. So, um, so the other part of this is that when we say the data-driven business or data-driven org, I know not every you know organization is you know retail or for profit even or you know there's government agencies. I thought it was helpful to kind of see what is that span of the different folks in a variety of industries, and I found this one super interesting. And again, I've been doing this forever, and, and back in the day, for the rest of you who have been doing this forever too, you may remember it seemed like the only folks really doing data management were sort of finance and government, right? The, and you'll still see their kind of the top two up there. But what I find exciting and on, on a good day, why I really love my job is just the, the growth of the variety of industries. If I just think of our practice over the five, you know, past several years, we've worked with museums, we've worked with not prom profits, we've worked with a bunch of different fun retail companies or video or media companies, right? Everybody, um, your schools, you know, <laughs> government agency, everybody is doing data, right? Not just the big ones. So I think most of those in that list, we, we've probably touched in the past several years as well. And I find that super exciting. And it's also probably why a lot of you are on the call. It also will explain as we go through some of the trends, kind of the level of maturity of some of these practices that, yeah, maybe a, a Wall Street company has been doing something like data governance for 20 years. I hope they have, if, if they're holding my money. Um, but maybe someone new like, uh, um, entertainment company that hasn't particularly done a lot of data driven in the past, maybe not so much. So that might explain some of the findings we'll show later, but I find this interesting to me. It's that long tail, you know, some of those smaller percentages that I'm sure we'll see growing. Retail is a big one. I know we see a lot of that. And when you think of it, amazon.com, right? Walmart, you know, those are, those are some of the biggest companies on the, on the planet and they are super data driven. And one of their competitive differentiators is absolutely data. So, you know, I, I found this an interesting uh, statistic. So the other one that's interesting, and it's one old big pie chart, which we and we love to hate pie charts. Um, just that basic question, do you see data as a corporate asset? Um, and yes, and, and for the younger folks on the call or people new to the industry that, you know, are so used to things being data driven, you'll say, yeah, and... Um, now I feel like the old, old grandma here. Well, in our day, we had to walk uphill both ways and not, it wasn't necessarily always considered a data as a corporate asset. And, um, many of you may have, have met me or seen me at a lot of uh, the data diversity conferences, and I've been doing those for probably 20 years now. And in the day, the biggest topic was always, how do you get the attention from the business? You know, how do we get the, you know, really get a seat at the table, and I say now, be careful what you ask for, because now the topic of these conversations is, you know, how do we go at the speed of business and how do we really engage all of this business stakeholders with all the different needs? You know, it's very rarely that nobody cares, right? It's that too many people care and how do we manage that? So I see this as a positive, obviously that no, um, you know, we would love this to be 100%. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of, yes, we know data is important, but do we truly treat it as an asset? Right. I think very few people would say that management doesn't care about data at all, but there's caring and there's there's nurturing. Right? Do we truly manage it? You know, you could even say, I don't know, we're a, a taxi company. Do we truly treat our taxi cars as a asset? I've been in plenty of taxis that I don't think they do. Right. <laughs> so it doesn't mean that it's not important, but are we truly managing it in the right way? Um, so as we move ahead, I want to talk a little bit about this business aspect of data management. It's a huge part of, of what we do every day in my practice is that data-driven data, -driven data man a business-driven data management. I mean, if we're not focusing on the business or the org drivers, why are we doing anything? And, and I'm not just doing it from my own personal perspective, um, but also this played out in the research that this is one of them. We talk about what's the next big thing. A lot of it is, you know, how do we have business and data really become more of a cohesive group and rather than two separate us versus them. So one thing I like to think of when we're looking at business drivers or organizational drivers, are we looking kind of offensively, um, you know, which is kind of that, that, that classic carrot and stick. You might wonder about these pictures, right? So the, the carrot is, I'm thinking about opportunity. I'm thinking of benefits. I'm a growth mindset. Think of, you know, a stereotypical uh, Silicon Valley startup 
we're going to be big, we're going to be large, we're going to move fast and break things, and we're going to be the best um, and watch out for us, right? Very off offense or sales driven type of organization. Defense, it might be more on regulation or risk reduction, and it's more of a mindset of caution. You know, maybe a I don't know, medical device testing company, right? I would hope you're, you're sort of defensive or you know, and some, some companies are a bit of both. Think of, I don't know, insurance or financial services. Obviously, there's a growth mindset, but regulation and risk reduction and caution is a huge part of their business, right? So whenever I'm doing anything in data management for a client or for myself, I like to think of these this aspect of, are, are we thinking of offense in, in our data management? Are we building new dashboards to see new business drivers and, and beat the competition? Or, and, or are we all looking more de defensively? Are we trying to, uh, you know, do data lineage for audit and things like that, right? Probably both, uh, but generally a company has a focus or a mindset and it's really important to, to think of that. One of the reasons I bring that up is one of my favorite questions in the survey that we have is, is what's driving the need for data management? Because to me, this is the huge, so what? I mean, I am a full, fully self-proclaimed nerd and I love data management and probably would just do it for the fun of it. Um, but I probably wouldn't get paid to be doing it just for the fun of it. Business folks want some sort of ROI. So why are people, what are the business drivers for data management? And I know this is a data architecture webinar. Data management is a super set of data architecture, but bear with us. I think they're so closely related. Um, it makes sense to cover it here. The number one reason for data management that has been number one in every single survey we've done in the past many years is gaining insights through reporting and analytics. I would also include things like AI machine learning kind of embedded in that advanced analytics. But most business people, you know, for good or bad, when people are thinking of data, they often think of their dashboards, reporting, analytics, and that sort of thing. Number two is saving cost and increasing efficiency. I actually love that because we often try to quote, sell that in data management, something like master data management. If you don't have nice organized customer information or product information or supplier information, you're becoming much more efficient, inefficient, right? So a lot of you know companies that are looking to do data management really are trying to be more efficient and be more lean. Digital transformation is another big one. Again, I expect this one probably to go away after a while because it's become so much of just the de facto way of doing things. It's sort of like the dot-com boom. You know, everyone's a dot-com now, right? If you're not a dot-com, you're missing something, right? But, but that is a big area of, you know, data is the foundation for digital. If you don't have a good product hierarchy, how can you sell your products online, right? Um, if you don't understand your customer base, how do you target them online, et cetera, et cetera. And you will see regulations and risk, which are kind of your classic, you know, stick rather than carrot. Uh, but you'll see some of the others, and I won't read through them all because I'm sure you have been reading them as I as I ramble. Um, but, you know, customer satisfaction, product quality, revenue growth. The one I like, too, is the one towards the bottom there. Um, these are just the top ones. It's not every single one. You know, improving outcomes, health, education. We tend to, and maybe because it's easy, we sort of talk about customers and products. You know, we work with a lot of, you know, higher ed universities or government agencies, and it's how do I support student outcomes? How do I have better... Um, you know, citizen experience from a local government, right? It isn't always about how do we make more widgets and sell more money. Um, so I, I think this is important to remember as we focus on data management, which is the why. And in the past few years, we we do, you know, do this every January in terms of when, when the survey comes out, kind of what are the trends for the coming year. I um, like to do my unofficially called carrot or stickometer. And <laughs> what does this mean? I, when we look at this, you know, which of these drivers are more of that offense where we're kind of carrot and we're, we're driving and, and what is more of a defensive? And you'll see one, I kind of split the difference, that saving cost and increasing efficiency. Um, so, something like reporting and analytics or digital transformation or customer satisfaction, those seem very much to me kind of driven by business needs. We want to grow, we want to understand our customers, et cetera. Saving cost almost seems your classic, you know, kind of st stick, right? I'm, I'm trying to cut costs, but my case is that improving efficiency, generally when, when we're working with customers and it's something like MDM and it is one of these customers that are, let's move fast and let's grow and be lean and mean and, and efficient. You know, that, that to me is the, the carrot version <laughs> of, of saving cost. You know, saving cost might be, uh, we're not growing. So, you know, let's just cut cut folks or cut, cut, cut you know, departments or cut, cut buildings. Um, efficiency is, hey, we want to be lean and mean to grow faster, right? And it's, they're kind of two sides of a similar coin, but I, that's why I kind of split the difference on that one. But 
What's interesting here is this is a very carrot driven, opportunity driven, right? And I know a lot of us in data management tend to be sort of risk averse. We, we feel like we're just maybe keeping the lights on for the business, but I don't think the business feels that way, right? People want to be data driven for a reason. Um, so I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, and so what I find interesting and uh, a word I did not coin, um, but I like it, you know, anecdata, right? Well, it does what I just showed match what I see in the real world, right? So we are data driven, but we know that a lot of our information or evidence is driven on personal experience rather than something that came from a survey like the one we're, we're basing this, this presentation on. So uh, the next thing I'll show you is not from the Dataversity Global Data Strategy Survey, but um, from some um, real world experience I'll kind of share. So. I do a lot of workshops with Dataversity. If you've, if you've been to any of the on-site events, you might've seen me there. And when I do a session on data strategy or data management, um, I, I often ask this question, as you're trying to look at the strategy of your organization, is your organization more on the offense or defense, right? Because if you're doing a data strategy or a data management plan, you should be thinking of this. This focuses on the why, right? And I've already covered this, that you know, offense is all about growth, profitability, customer satisfaction, competitive advantage. Defense is more about compliance, regulation, avoiding audits, fraud, you know, security and privacy concerns. And then I ask, where is your org? Are you fully, you know, offense, new startup, want to grow, sell more widgets, defense, we're high risk, we really are all about regulation. Or as in most companies, there's some kind of purple aspect of offense is red, defense is blue. Most folks have an aspect of that or even different people within the org, you know, maybe sales is very red and, and all in the offense and, and growth, maybe legal, right? Or privacy group, or maybe a little more on the defense, which makes sense. So what I tend to do is I ask uh, the people in my workshop, we may have 70 people in the workshop, where do you think your organization is on the spectrum? And again, my anecdata of people raising their hand, generally it comes out that it's sort of 80% stick and 20% carrot, which to me doesn't jive, right? Because when you look at the, the surveys of business opportunities, it's all a whole bunch of carrots, a whole bunch of opportunity. When you look at the, the different orgs, you know, are, are we going to say that, you know, retail and, and you know, manufacturing are, are very, you know, kind of only risk averse, I would put some of those and very much the offense, or if you think, you know, generally at these conferences, it's a cross section of most industries, it didn't seem to jive with me. And, and, and really, I think it's just we as an industry, in a way, we're, we're kind of paid to be the data governance folks, the data architects, the folks that make sure nothing breaks folks, right? That That is, we are sort of naturally, many of us, and I am super stereotyping across all of this, so noted, but, um, we, we tend to be more defense because that's what we sort of feel a lot of it is what we, we're keeping the lights on. We're making sure the architecture doesn't break. We're making sure the data is right and create and, and accurate. But but what's sort of the, the risk of, of that can almost in some ways conflicting mindsets um, and bear with me with this following picture. Um, but I often say the good news, if you are a data centric professional, you do have a seat at the table, right? Business people want to be data-driven. They want kind of that trusted advisor to be able to talk to and say, hey, what could we do with dashboards? You know, how could we be more efficient with master data? But we're often seen as kind of the, the downer, right? So my very odd picture, bear with me. Um, you know, you, you're going to be at the boardroom with a bunch of carrots, right? And you may be the lone stick or maybe you and and legal or, you know, or, or the fraud, you know, the security group. Um, so just think of that. You are at the table and not that you need to be all Pollyanna and, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, data quality doesn't matter and, and data architecture doesn't matter and governance doesn't, it certainly does, but can we flip the script a bit? And again, you know, not only think of the stick, but think of how do we, you know, think of that difference between cost reduction and efficiency in a way it's similar, but can you word it in a different way, right? Can we say if we're more lean and a mean, we can grow better and things like that. So just think of it, I think it is kind of a personality type thing or it's what we're focusing on things. So and I do it myself. I'm, you know, up all night trying to fix something or especially when I used to be kind of more on the, you know, real hands-on coding tech 
And, and I, I spent all night fixing the bug and I go to do the demo. Oh, what do I focus on? I focus on the bug I just fixed. I'm like, really, Donna? 90% of the application works, but what's top of mind are the problems. Or, you know, this just kind of, the, again, that's what we're often focusing on. But maybe something to think of as we think about what is the next big thing is because I do feel that it's the, um, that the blurring of the lines between business and quote technical or data management because the tools are getting easier to do the the business drivers are so data driven we really need to be more we use the term data literacy um, but I think it goes both ways is business literacy for data people right so uh, humor me with that weird picture but I <laughs> there's something you'll remember if nothing else um, so I, I this kind of leads into this next slide which I have found interesting because it has evolved over the years since we did the survey you know. And back in the day when you said who's driving data management, it was maybe your CIO or your CTO or the IT team. Absolutely not that anymore. Um, over, over and above anything else that sort of, and again, this is a multiple choice, right? So it isn't only, it is an and. Um, so you'll see the, the breadth of different roles, but very often led by the data governance role, the data governance lead. To me, that makes sense because data governance lead is one of those roles that kind of needs to span both business and understand business drivers and work with data owners and data stewards, but also understand data architecture and data management best practices and be able to talk with the technical team as well. So that makes a lot of sense. You'll see chief data officer is number three. I often see um, data governance lead as a stepping stone to something like a chief data officer, because what does a good data governance lead do? They have to evangelize, they have to build buy-in, they have to understand the business and tech, which really is a chief data officer role, right? So often that is an evolution if you are a data governance lead and that is a, a goal of yours to be more of a chief data officer. I think that's absolutely reasonable. But what I think is interesting and has evolved, you'll see in the color coding, uh, the brownish there is 2022, the dark blue is 2023. Over time, we've started adding roles because there were so many write-in answers. You know, chief operating officer was one folks kept writing in. So we put in BI team, the, you know, uh, the, a lot of these business-driven roles um, have kind of been added. So I, I find that kind of, again, that long tail-ish <laughs> um, really exciting. And the, the high level of C-level folks that are driving things. So we talked about CIO and CDO, probably not a huge surprise that they're driving data management. What I love to see is that CEO and the CFO and the COO, right? That means that from the very top, the business is really understanding that data drives the business and they want, more importantly, a seat at the table themselves, right? So they really want to help drive the data management. Do they have all the skills to do that? No, uh, they understand the business, but that's where a good data architect, a good data management lead um, can really help bridge that gap. So um, moving on, this is one of my absolute favorite questions on the survey because it validates what I see all the time um, and almost come to fisticuffs with people who disagree with me, especially at a data, data diversity conference and folks will say, you know, I can never get the business involved, you know, interested in a data model or a data architecture diagram. And I get quite bold and I say, well, then you're doing it wrong because I have, and I will stand by that, you know, meet me outside um, because I've absolutely seen the opposite and this data proves it, darn it here, right? That when people say, what is some of the you know benefit of using a defined data architecture? Number one, what and number one and two is collaboration across IT and then collaboration with the business, right? And, and that may seem odd if that hasn't you know happened to you in your daily world. So I think data architecture is something like a data model. I use conceptual and logical data models all the time to have conversations with business folks and very often they say, thank you so much. I've never had this explained in such a clear way. You've been able to communicate my business problems, whether it's a hierarchy for a product hierarchy or, you know, the customer relationships, that's all, it's their world, right? And, and a data model is a way to explain the business and IT together. I would also put out a good old fashioned like system architecture diagram. Here's your source to target you know, lineage of how your sources go into the warehouse and get reported out to your reporting and analytics platform. I mean, I've had a lot of business people say, thank you for showing me that. That finally clarifies how some of these data flows might cause problems and things like that. If it's done well, it actually adds clarity. And again, you don't want to bore business folks with a, 
a really detailed physical data model or something like that. But I think at that high level kind of, you know, conceptual logical type, it, it's a really great way to explain as well as with IT, right? If we don't have a map of where we're going, you know, how do, how do we collaborate together? So um, that one's, that one's really hit home with me and, th and then you'll get the rest of it, right? Increased data quality, consistency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that one, we don't have a defined data architecture makes me sad, but but we will have that go down in, in, in future years, I'm sure. <laughs> More people will see the value. So found that one interesting because not uh, generally, I think when people say, you know, why do you have a data architecture? You know, collaboration with the business probably doesn't come top of mind, but it absolutely is a, is a helpful way. So um, we talked about governance. So all of what we talked about you know, a data governance lead, driving data management, data architecture, collaborating with the business, that's really a data, a tool of data of data governance. So um, you'll see that across the past three years, um, you know, data governance has has is popular, it has grown, most folks are doing it, but you will see a lot of folks feel that they're still in the lower level of maturity um, or they're just starting to implement. So you know, the folks at a higher level of maturity, you'll see at least self-identified, they're fairly low. You know, are we self-critical as an industry and we can know we can always get better? Maybe. Does it take time to fully have a governance framework to kick in at 100%? Also, um, you know, you can get a lot of benefit out of data governance right out of the gate. So I don't want to depress folks who, who you know, are just starting. But to make it, you know, truly sing, that's going to be true for any department, HR, or finance, you know, you don't, you don't get 100% when you first start. Um, I also think the reason for this is when we think of all those industries on that chart in the very beginning, so many new types of industries are now becoming data-driven that they literally are just starting with data governance. I know, again, in our practice, a big part of it is people who are start out becoming data-driven, and we'll talk more about that, have started with their dashboards and then have some issues with trust in the dashboards or trying to become digital and move their products to the web and find out that their product data isn't really in a state that they can do that well. And then they go back to, can we have some governance, please? So that kind of, to me, explains some of that, um, and, you know, that we're either starting it now or that we're in the initial stages of maturity. So anyway, interesting. Um, so the other thing is, what are you planning to implement in the future? And I'm starting to sound like a broken record, data governance, data governance, data governance, but it is true. Um, the other one, which I love to see, because it's a big part of what I do for a living is data strategy. And what's the difference between something like strategy and management? Well, a lot of it is the alignment with the business and making sure that your data architecture and your data management plans are strategic and they mat align with what the business is trying to do. To me, that's almost the core definition of what a strategy is versus what governance or architecture or management is. Um, and then you'll see some of the other cast of characters we're all familiar with, data quality, master data, metadata. Um, and so what I find interesting, and, and we, we sort of talked around it, you'll see some of the ones towards the bottom are still initiative plan, like self-service analytics, data science, AI, machine learning. Um, it's not that that at my, again, this is part data and part Donna's opinion, so it's probably, or a bit anic data, right? So based on things I've been seeing with my, my clients and in the industry, um, people absolutely want to do data science and AI machine learning and self-service reporting analytics, but get to a certain point and say, hmm, data isn't quite there yet. So let's go back to the fundamentals and make sure we have governance and strategy and quality and master and metadata, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the, these don't work against each other. It's It's telling that same story of, want to do the cool business driven stuff got to get that foundation right first so um on that note when we say what are you absolutely in, um using now so this previous one is what are you looking to do in the future this one the green one is what are you act, actually doing today and no surprise because it was one of the top drivers earlier business intelligence data warehousing self-service analytics are still top of the, the heap, right? Because that, that's what people are trying to get to. Uh, we don't see AI machine learning and data science here as much. It doesn't mean there's not an interest. I think, again, that's an evolution. Um, and then again, some of the foundational things like security governance architecture are supporting that. Really what people are trying to do is get insights from the business to drive their organization. So I think these are telling some of that similar story. 
So we talked about data warehouse on that previous one. And to me, when I hear, you know, business intelligence and data warehouse together in the same sentence, that doesn't seem weird to me. Um, but that isn't the only tool in the toolkit anymore. Uh, and so we always ask about this idea of a data lake. And again, if you've been looking in the industry, there's this buzzword bingo, right? We have data warehouses, data lakes, now data lake houses, now data fabrics, now there's a lot of different things. So we sort of broke that down. The specific question was around, are you implementing a data lake? And so number one answer was no, um, which is fine. Not everybody has a use case for a data lake. You know, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Still, when we're talking about a lot of the data-driven reporting, show me how many, many widgets I sold by region, by product over time, kind of structured data warehousing type reporting. Doesn't Nothing wrong with that. That is a lot of the, in, the information that drives the business. However, there's a lot of other unstructured, especially as we get into things like AI and, and machine learning and things like that. So the second most popular, this does resonate with what I see all the time in my day job, um, is that a data lake is used in conjunction with a data warehouse, which to me, and you know, we can argue semantics or the or, or the exactly what that means, but that's a data lake house to me, right? So you can you can have your cake and eat it too in a certain way that we can, you know, that kind of um, ELT instead of ETL, right? That we we can't you don't have to limit ourselves to only the things we're going to slice and dice by in our BI report. We can get a broader areas information. It's sort of that that broader landing zone. If you're familiar with kind of late landing staging warehouse kind of world, well, just think of your. You know, I know I'm oversimplifying for folks that may be critical on the call, but you know, just think of your data lake. You, you've broadened your landing area, right? I don't just land my ERP structured data, but it could be video files or streaming data or you know a lot of other non-structured data as well, or just raw data. I don't know how I'm going to transform it. Let's just take it from its raw source um, and be able to use that for things like you know, exploratory analytics. Yes, absolutely. If that's your only solution, data lakes can become data swamps very quickly. Um, so I would not just say dump everything and good luck to you later. I, I would say I'm old enough to have seen a complete Gartner hype cycle come and go, <laughs> which was data lake, where you know for a while, and, and any of us in the industry rolled our eyes when we heard it, of, oh, we don't need these things like data warehouses and struct ODS and structured data. Just data lake is the new way to go. And like anything, it's not either or, it's and, right? So that data lakes have their place. They aren't the end all be all where you can just dump stuff and magic happens, right? Um, but by the same token, you don't have to structure everything into facts and dimensions or relational data stores and things like that. So hopefully that's an interesting kind of metric um, of kind of what other folks are doing as the back end for some of that BI and analytics that we talked about is one of the main drivers. So um, I always find this one interesting because what can be very confusing if you're in the industry is what platform do I use? You know, do I use a, a data lake? Can I get away from relational? Am I old fashioned because I'm using a relational database? Should I be using you know something different like a, a cloud um, you know based graph? pattern database or something, right? And again, it's and, not necessarily or. There's a lot of options out there. But um, when you look, and this has been true year over year, every single year we've had the survey, the number one data source that folks are using are relational databases. So you'll see here still, and this was from 2023, the number one platform in use is relational on-premises databases, right? Not even in the cloud. You'll see cloud has been moving up. It's number three there. And the thing that keeps me up at night and will forever make me sad is number two, is that spreadsheets is one of the top data sources. Now, for those of you who love your spreadsheet, I love spreadsheets too. They are an excellent tool. I use them every single day. But as a data management platform for an enterprise, they are not the solution to use, right? So, I mean, better than pencil and paper, but um, the fact that people correctly self-identified, kudos, People aren't sort of hiding things and pretending, you know, we're not doing that anymore. Um, but I would say, you know, <laughs> and this has been true as long as I've been in the industry, you know, what are the top database platforms out there? Well, spreadsheets and then <laughs> Oracle or, you know, what's that one name vendors, but you get the idea. So um, interesting. Um, and the, what I also find interesting, and this has been consistently true across the different years we've been doing this, is the legacy systems mainframe 
COBOL, et cetera, right? So, um, you know, for the boomers and Gen X or whatever out there, uh, your code's still working, right? We can we can kind of knock knock some of the old fashioned folks, but um, a lot of that code was well written and it's still running a lot of the financial services and other you know big you know government and, and big agencies out there. Partly because they've been doing it so long, I could also say that maybe they were designed and built very well, also. So, um, also think of that. Um, as you have some new people on the team, and when we, we this isn't the topic of this presentation, but you know, automated metadata discovery. Are you gonna have a twenty year old out of college read Cobol copy books? <laughs> Probably not. But you know, are there tools that can extract some of the metadata for that person and get the knowledge from that? Yes, there are. So um, there's a lot of good tools that can help with this disparate set of systems out there um, because there are a lot of options. I guess. I get slightly disappointed on this, and this isn't the full, when you read the full paper, you'll see that, you know, people are using a lot of the, you know, um, you know, key value pair, and I guess there's some that we just kept that kind of non-relational or, or um, graph databases and things, but not as much as maybe I'd like to see, given that there's so much exciting stuff out there in the industry, it really is what's running your business is relational database spreadsheets and some COBOL, <laughs> so, um, that's fine. And so, but where are people headed, right? And, and what you do see is when you look ahead, um, there are some different things folks are considering that maybe isn't just the relational database. What I think you'll see here is that even with the relational database, it is now much more going to the cloud. I don't see a lot of net new development on on-premises databases. Doesn't mean you have to go to the cloud. I have, you know, there are many companies out there that either have their own data center or their own you know, databases as reasons not to, um, both price and security and other things. So um, you'll also see that number two is no longer spreadsheets. And I'm not sure if just people don't want to say it out loud, but uh, you'll see that it's still number four, people at least admitting they'll be there, but uh, you will see that cloud object storage, which is sort of that cloud data lake. So this sort of says to me, these are your data lake houses. And I, I'm seeing that a lot too. Again, you do are, are able now to kind of have that idea of the, the best of both worlds that you can have the, the power of the data lake storage and the scalability of that and the power of relational databases. Because you know, relational, relational databases are absolutely not only your, your only tool in the toolkit, but they're really good at what they do, right? If you're looking at you know referential integrity and data quality checks and things like that, um, that's kind of your relational model. And also it is again that that and condition, not everything is either or. I've seen a lot of companies um, kind of rationalize their data into master data stores or data warehouse type stores um, or structured ODS or whatever, and then apply from those cleanse data sets your more exploratory graph patterns and and things like that. Um, so you can have the best of both worlds that I'm I'm, I'm cleaning and understanding and managing my data in the relational world. That's a great way to feed some of the you know data science and, and more exploratory type analytics. So I always find this one fun. Maybe next year I'll be proven wrong and real-time streaming will be the number one <laughs> item or something, right? So, but we will see. I, I expect really if I had my crystal ball, relational databases aren't going anywhere and they really haven't over the past surveys. Um, so what is the next big thing? You came to this webinar to hear it, and I feel I may have kind of disappointed you. It isn't the big sexy stuff. <laughs> it's kind of the fundamentals, right? So yes, is there sexy stuff or exciting stuff or whatever word you want to use in terms of gaining insights, reporting, and analytics? Is there exciting stuff with analytics and interesting machine learning AI? Is so much more opportunity with things like self-service BI even? Absolutely. So that is, I think, some of the, you know, carrot versus stick exciting stuff. However, um, what seems to be a trend is may, folks start out with something like self-service analytics or, or start out wanting to do some AI and machine learning and then very quickly realize that without that foundation, without things like data governance, without cross-functional business and IT alignment, which is supported by data governance, underpinned by a solid data architecture, um, run on a mix of relational data lake storage, which I think is Maybe it's not a big new thing anymore, but I do see that growing. That that almost is, whereas that was pretty next generation a few years ago, it almost is the default way of working for so many companies now that you can do so much in the cloud. 
as well as, and, and it, it wasn't a big focus of the, the survey, um, you know, maybe next year that'll come out, or maybe it's just a new way of working of, I see less of these kind of static architectures where I'm building a, a warehouse only or an ODS only or a, you know, data lake only. And it's, whether it's, you know, capital F data fabric from a vendor or just lowercase data fabric, which sort of means to me, you know, ecosystems of solutions, because, you know, a lot of these cloud vendors allow you to have kind of a data lake house and also some real-time streaming patterns or some, you know, to great tools for data science and AI. And, and so there are so many different choices. I, I really see that kind of this next big thing is a lot of interrelated ecosystems of solutions where, and I think the data lake house where, although I think the name is goofy, <laughs> there I'm saying it being recorded, um, the concept makes a lot of sense. And I think that lake house and who, who knows what word will be created for that, uh, I don't know, a lake community, right? Where we have so many different tools with, you know, not only relational, well, they exist already, right? In a lot of these cloud platforms, you can have, you know, no SQL stores and you can have a lot of different patterns that aren't relational. So you can have these fit for purpose use cases. That's my sort of prediction that wasn't in the survey, but we're sort of heading there. And I think that just, it just makes a lot more sense. As long as, you know, when, when we develop um, architectures for clients, I, I like to just call them zones, in a way, right? This is our relational zone where we're doing some cleansing or reporting from, and this is our data lake pattern zone, or this is our streaming data zone, right? Because there's so much, you know, think of cell phone data or IoT data. A lot of that is real time. You manage that in a very different way uh, than you would, you know, something for your, your master data, right? So again, it doesn't mean master data goes away. <laughs> they, they can work together. So, um, so, Good old quote from Michael Jordan, right? Get the fundamentals down and the level of everything else you do will rise. And I think that makes a lot of sense um, in the data management world, right? Yes, is there so much really incredible, amazing opportunity to drive the business through data and through data management? And are there amazing different, you know, innovations coming out with real-time data and with, you know, pattern detection data and AI machine learning? Yes, but... We've all heard the quote, garbage in, garbage out. That can only, you can only fly on the shoulders of a guy just mixed up <laughs> the analogy. But right, you can, you need those fundamentals. Or you're not going to be able to jump like Michael Jordan, right? So think of that as you're thinking of your architecture. It isn't old fashioned. It isn't stogy or you're not the only stick amongst carrots. So think of how we, we, we word that, right? It's a foundation for future success. It's not stop everything. You can't possibly do any reporting or analytics or AI and machine learning until we do all of this, but you need the right foundation to help grow this in the future. So just a kind of a different way to, to think of it that way. So in summary, you know, business intelligence analytics, absolutely still a driver. Operational data as well, but really BI and analytics seems to be a lot of what the, the business is focusing on. And can we think of whatever we're doing in data management, think of it as that, that stick, that offense, that business value approach, because the stuff we're doing that can feel like a stick, <laughs> like governance, like data quality, like metadata, gosh, I, I started my career with met, the, in the back, in the old days, we called them metadata repositories. Now they're data catalogs. One of the hottest things out there, and I still have to almost pinch myself that something like metadata is now such a cool, hot trending thing. Um, why? Because people want quality data. I mean, it makes sense. Um, it's just maybe not what you think of as top of mind when you're thinking of, you know, data-driven business. These are absolutely the foundations. And again, relational databases will still be there. They're not going anywhere. Are there other tools in the toolkit? Absolutely. So hopefully those are some things to think about. Hopefully you found the research interesting. Again, download the white paper from either our website or Dataversity. Um, and if this was of interest of you, please don't hesitate to join the rest of our lineup. Next month is on data strategy. So if this idea of business alignment with architecture was of interest to you, we'll be doing a whole lot of more of that next month because that's really the underpinnings of the data strategy. Um, we do this for a living. If you need help, let me know. My email's on the first page. And I want to open it up for questions with Shannon. So over to you, Shannon. 
Anna, thank you so much for another great presentation here and interesting insights into 2024. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants uh, by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and recording. But diving in here, Donna, uh, offense or defense, instead of being determined by the organization's industry, doesn't it have to be more to do with the specific business concerns or opportunities the firm is facing and wishes the data strategy to help resolve? I, I think that's fair. I think it's, again, yet again, a, a both and. So I think definitely the the, the industry, um, and, and partly it's just your your wording, right? So I think, you know, not that I've ever made a mistake, but I, I think, you know, I was talking to one of our education clients and I, I think I, I used the word monetize student data and they they were just shocked that I that I was talking about selling kids data online. That's not what I meant. I meant of looking for business opportunities. So some of that was just wording, right? Um, but every every company is going to have that purple zone of maybe some initiatives. Maybe I am. Gosh, I'm working with several companies right now. We're trying to do a big, you know, cu customer drive or, or or student drive, patient drive, whatever it is. But but the privacy around customers is paramount. So there's a perfect. I, I want to do the the carrot, but there's a stick aspect of that, that I, I want to make sure the data is protected in order to do that. I'd also say, even though it wasn't in the question, you know, I may, might have mentioned this before too, it's a, even different people within each organization, right? And not to stereotype, but, you know, may, maybe, maybe finance is more cautious or legal is more cautious and sales and marketing might be a little more carrot driven, right? So it, it's definitely nuanced. But I do think thinking of it in that mind, like which conversation am I having? Because often you're doing the sales pitch and you want to make sure you're you're using the right language. If there's someone's doing a big sales campaign, you don't want to lead with, well, can't do any of that until the you know quality's cleaned up. Yeah, you know, just it, some of it's a, a way of presenting what you're trying to do. You could say, hey, we're trying to get the quality right so we can have this awesome campaign. You know, it's just kind of flipping the script a little bit. Hope that helped. Definitely. So Donna, what are so many, there are so many definitions, levels of data strategy. So what do you consider are the key elements of a data strategy? Oh, I will answer that quickly, but I will refer to the, the questioner to the, that's the whole topic for next month's session. Um, but I, I would just say at, at its simplest and how we generally do it, a lot of it is, you know, defining Key difference of a data strategy versus data management is what are you trying to do as an organization? How do you align with the business and what are you trying to achieve? That's the biggest one. Understanding where you are, whether it's a maturity assessment, current state architecture, understanding. You know, we we want to be the coolest AI-driven company in the world, but we're still on spreadsheets. Well, that kind of shows you the gap, right? And that leads to where you want to head in terms of what is my future state architecture. We want to be the best, most awesome thing. We're on spreadsheets. We want to get to a cloud-based lake house. These are the steps to get there. And then that's the roadmap, which is how do we get there? Because it's going to take you years, no matter what. I mean, it's it's a strategy, right? If it were six months, it would be a tactic. So a strategy, by definition, looks far out, a long term out. Um, the steps to get there. And then don't forget the change management plan, which is, mar you could say that's marketing, but it's really winning hearts and minds, right? Because you can have this great plan. Does everybody across the organization want to come with you? So hopefully that helps. Thank you. So is there a specific architecture that is best for advanced analytics and machine learning? Um, well, I, yeah, I, I, that's a hard question. I, I mean, I, I do think this idea of the data lake house or even a kind of a data fabric where you have, you know, there's a lot of these cloud platforms, the idea that you can load some of the, the raw data where you need to, you can have different, um, you know, timing, it doesn't always have to be kind of batch overnight, can be really important. And then you have different tools within that platform. So I think a lot of these kind of, I call it a fabric, which is kind of an ecosystem of tools, which is also kind of a, a lake house, right? It's, it's you know, but but I don't want to say it's only something like a lake because, you know, things like master data and do I have the right customer list and things like that. It's generally a mix where you have some of the trusted data sets, um, but also the flexibility to have some more exploratory as long as you know what lives where, right? Don't mix the two. Is this a trusted source? Or are we looking at, you know, social media analytics where it really is more trending or ideas? You know, we're not we're not going to base our financials off social media trending. That's a, That would be the warehouse, right? But we don't want, you wouldn't necessarily put social media trending 
in a warehouse if that doesn't make sense. So it's it's more of that ecosystem approach. Awesome. So uh, great questions coming in here. You know, uh, has the concept of data culture bubbled up in your analysis? It seems like a catch-all term for data governance, strategy, quality, et cetera. Would you agree? Um, absolutely. Data culture is huge. Um, and that there, in, in the survey itself, there was a bit of that. The other word that kept bubbling up um, was data literacy. And on last year's trends, we did talk a lot about that. I prefer kind of data culture because data literacy almost sounds slightly insulting. <laughs> like it's almost not literate. You know, I think I talked about it earlier. You could say to IT, you need to be business literate, right? But I think having a data culture not only from the governance side, of, are there owners? Do people take accountability? Do they understand that they have a role in data quality? But even just from the data driven, are people using the dashboards to make a business decision, or is it still gut feel? Right? Oh, you don't tell me. You tell me how what my customers are like. I've been working here twenty years. I know my customer. Right? So a data culture is very broad, but that's where in that previous question about how do you do a data strategy, we always include a organizational change management component. Right? Because how do you bring the hearts and minds of everyone along and Everyone knows their role in a data-driven org. So yeah, absolutely. It's a big part of it. And is it a good idea ever to access the ODS, to access ODS to uh, internal business users or data warehouse or to give access, I should say? Um, well, and ODS is probably one of those things that has, I think has the worst definition most yeah, but I mean at its core I think an operational data store is not necessarily a staging area right because I think of a warehouse maybe it's landing staging you know warehouse and an ODS is often used truly as an operational data store and then yes it could be shown to the business users because the warehouse might be show me widgets over time <laughs> in, in growth but an opera is truly that operational layer da data that you're not hitting source systems you're you're having that internal group um, so it isn't necessarily sort of a thing that goes before the warehouse. It's its own first order thing of operational data for reporting and analytics. That That's fine to me. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so Donna, do all of the, does Databricks, Microsoft Fabric and Snowflake, do they all have the same data architecture pattern in the analytics offering? I never like to talk about vendors specifically, but I, I do think in general um, that they all have similar ideas, right? Right, and, and they all have strengths and weaknesses and let the vendors battle it out themselves. But yeah, when I was sort of talking about that ecosystem where, yeah, I can have a, a lake storage or different, you know, tiers of, you know, a lot of customers that sort of silver, bronze, gold or whatever, instead of, instead of you know, warehouse and everything else, it's just different patterns of storage. A lot of them have these kind of real-time streaming stores and a lot of them have very different AI offerings, machine learning offerings, BI tool offerings. Um, and I think they're all trying to battle it out amongst themselves of where they differentiate. But I, I think that pattern of the cloud offers do a whole lot of different, again, I call them zones. You know, you may have a key value pair zone for your website stuff, which is very different than your warehouse for your relational facts and dimensions, right? So I do think that's a trend. And I think it's a good one. It's just use it wisely. And that's where an architecture comes in. You know, wh what do you put where? Don't just dump stuff in there and we know what's going to happen. So hopefully that helps. You lots of great questions here. So Donna, do you recommend Star Schema still uh, in the clouds and say Databricks? Yes. Very rarely get a just a de facto answer like that. We actually did last year on diversity. It should still be out there. We did, you know, is the star schema still viable? And I think yes, for for several reasons. One, it's not just a not just for, for performance anymore, right? So can some of these systems now just be a lot faster? And could you dump a bunch of stuff and have it be performant? Probably. Um, but one of the nice things about a fact to mention is that business logic, right? And a lot we still do a good old fashioned bus matrix, right? What are your what are you measuring? What's the definition of that measure? What do you want to slice it by in terms of a conformed dimension that links with your master data? What do you mean by a department? Gosh, I've been doing this for 30 years. That's still going to be a question at every company. <laughs> and it doesn't mean they're behind. It means that's still a complicated thing. Is it a finance department, a sales department? And when you slice by department, what does that mean? 
a, day, a good old data warehouse with those facts and dimensions, really. It, it's just, it's structured in a way, I mean, it's a pivot table in Excel, right? We, we still use those, right? It's, it's, it's a very logical way of organizing things, which, you know, an architecture isn't only about how do I store the data in a fast, cheap way. So I, I absolutely, I think it makes a lot of sense. And a lot of these platforms still have a semantic layer and a cube and things like that. So it, yes, I do think it still exists. Perfect. And we've got about five minutes left. So Donna, you know, where would a supply chain fall in? I think that question came in when we were talking about the different industries, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, super early on. I think, yeah. I think each of those industries has a supply chain aspect. So, you know, retail um, has a supply chain that's one of those key stakeholders. Um, I, I think, it, or it maybe came in when we had the list of stakeholders. So yeah, I don't think you can write that in this year and when the survey comes out. Um, but yeah, the, I often think a supply chain is a big person that a, a data, one of the people in the data governance ecosystem that has a huge seat at the table in terms of product data, in terms of supplier data. Um, so I think they're big players. I think they weren't listed in any of the graphs, but it doesn't mean, I don't think, yeah, some of the other mar marketing wasn't on there either. And I think that's a big, always a big stakeholder as well. But yeah, good call out. I think supply chain. And when we talk about efficiency and lean, a lot of the folks that we work with that want master data management, it's kind of supply chain or some of the lean manufacturing and things like that that people are looking at. So yeah, good call. Are non-relational cloud databases increasing or decreasing in popularity? They are providing, uh, proving to be popular in the energy sector, even though one could argue it is an old technology. It, it interest. So yeah, I think that probably came up when we were, and I didn't. I do believe that the the white paper does have the trends over time. And either unfortunately or not, let, let's look at this one. You, you'll see that we, we it's kind of a big jump there, non-relational cloud databases. They've kind of stayed static over time. It, it, yeah, I'm, 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 maybe it's because that, that percentage of the use case is, you know, not everybody needs them. I think they're powerful. They still exist. And you're right, they have, they're not even really, it's like a data lake isn't new anymore. <laughs> These folks, things have been around for a while. It really, in terms of this survey, it really hasn't ticked up um, tons over time. Uh, so, and I don't know what that means. Is it people who take this survey or are kind of limited in their thinking of cloud or is it, I, you know, I, I I haven't seen, I, I still do in my practice see a lot of the core business driven use cases in a lot of that, you know, relational, but there's also streaming and and graph. And so, yeah, I, I guess I guess my, my gut is that I see a little bit more of these in what I see day to day. But the survey, this particular survey, it really hasn't like jumped up over time or, or even gone down over time. Don't know why. TBD. We'll see as we keep going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it has stayed pretty consistent. So uh, you know we've only got three minutes left, but and probably could spend a whole and and I know we have this topic on uh, on the list this year. But do you what what do you recommend the application of data governance will be? Um, yes, I'll do a blatant call out for, I think that's in April, we'll have a whole data governance, data architecture. Um, but yeah, I think you saw on this, on this particular survey, data governance popped up everywhere. So, I mean, I can only see that increase. I do hope we see, and I hope I don't make people dizzy going back to old slides here. Um, the one of we're in the initial stages. I mean, I, data governance has pretty consistently been growing over time of, People are absolutely interested in it because of the reasons we said they want to be data driven. You need good data. Like it just makes so much logical sense. I would love to see the initial stages start to get to that higher level of maturity, and hopefully, excuse me, in future surveys, we'll see that over time. All right, was that the last one, or do we have one more we squeeze in, Shannon? You tell me. No, that was the that was the last question. Oh, all right, we got them all. Yeah, and and perfect timing because we are right at the end of the hour <laughs> here. <laughs> well, Donna, thank you so much for another great kickoff to another year. Very excited about the upcoming webinars. And again, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. And thanks, Donna. Thank you.